All right. As always, uh, this one is going to be a little long, so we'll probably do it in a two part today and uh, finish up on Friday. Um, the more I was studying and, and preparing, <laughs> the more the Lord had me include in what we're going to uh, be studying today. So it, uh, it wound up being a little long, but I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. So let's get started here. Um, so this evening, we're going to start um, our study on the wilderness journey, the wilderness journey, talking about the, um, um, the situation with the Israelites leaving Egypt, going into the promised land, and all the things that happened to them in between that time. So why do we need to even do this study? Well, the Israelites' journey through the wilderness is, uh, well, in the, the Old Testament, teach people many lessons about faith and trusting God. Uh, one of the lessons, lessons is God will provide. God will provide for you even when it seems impossible. For example, God provided for the Israelites after an ambush by the Amalekites. God will make a way. God will always make a way, even when you are unfaithful. He's still faithful. God is good and merciful. In the wilderness, the Israelites learned to trust in God's goodness and mercy, even in the face of life's unpredictability. Sin can take you astray. That's what we learn when we study this. Sin can easily lead you away from God's direction. You don't need to be impressive. In the wilderness, you can learn that you don't need to be impressive, that the ordinary you is enough. So we're going to see a lot of things that um, the children of Israel went through and the lessons behind what they went through. Amen. So I'm going to give you a bit of history. Um on the subject as Moses leads God's people to the promised land. Uh, how many Israelites were there altogether? Anybody want to take a guess? Anybody re remember reading how many uh, Israelites uh, traveled that journey? I can just see y'all getting y'all's phone. Oh, I think yes, <laughs> at 270,000. Stop reading, huh? <laughs> 270,000? I was just going to say thousands. <laughs> You're going to take the safe route, right? Thousands. Yes. Well, if there's, there's two schools of thought. The two most common views on the population of the children of Israel are that they numbered over 2 million people or only about 30,000. That's a pretty big difference. Um, and, and that's uh, notably no uh, doctrinal or theological points rely on the precise population of Israel at the time of the Exodus. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the difference comes from. Uh, I would, whether like, to, I would like to add, Pastor Ivan, I would like to add my opinion. I think it was like the two million because they talked about at one point it was like 500,000. We put a lot of emphasis on just men then. And if you count how they would divvy out the men army and the ministry when they would go to battle, then it was like over 500,000 men. And then they just said, and women and other people and people from other nations also was with them, you know. That's okay. all. Right. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. So whether God freed 2 million or 30,000 from Egypt, scripture is clear. He did so miraculously. So mm -hmm. the number is not the, the big thing. Mm -hmm. uh, whether there was one, 20, uh, 80, 500, 3,000, 30,000 or 2 million, it doesn't, mm -hmm. it's, that's not the point. Okay, and the story uh, where you can find this information is in Exodus 6, 6, and also in Acts 7, 
35 through 36. Okay. Whether Israel's fighting force was more than half a million or several, several thousand, conquest of Canaan is credited entirely to God's intervention. Um, Deuteronomy 9, 7, uh, 4 through 5. Uh, in other words, it was God that uh, help them to make that journey in it. You will see the miraculous things that they went through. Uh, it would be just as hard to feed 30,000 people in a barren Sinai desert uh, territory as it would 2 million. There was nothing there, okay? There was nothing, there was no food there. It was dry as a bone. You've seen uh, a desert before you don't see a lot of green stuff you certainly don't see any farms or people growing things so uh, they totally had to depend on God for uh, their food uh, going to the desert okay there's a picture of Moses Moses was uh, the leader or uh, the first leader um, to be assigned by God to take them through this journey to the promised land. Moses and the Israelites. Although the book of Exodus opens over four centuries after the end of its predecessor, Genesis, it picks up right where Genesis left off. After spending 430 years in abject poverty, and enslaved by the Egyptian monarchy. The Israelites were desperately crying out to God for the deliverance uh, promised by Joseph in uh, Genesis 50, verse 25. Pastor Sam, you gotta read my scriptures for me tonight, please. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Genesis 50, 25, then Joseph took an oath from the children of Israel saying, God will surely visit you, and you shall carry up my bones from here. Okay, so they were kind of basing this on what Joseph said back in Genesis, um, where that's a whole story by itself, what they do after a person dies and with their bones and, and everything. Uh, but um, it, it seems that they knew that Joseph um, had mentioned that God would deliver them out of um, the evil situation that they were that they were in. Uh, they were there uh, for four hundred in in uh, slavery for four hundred and thirty years. Uh, is our country here? How old is the United States? Somebody? <laughs> Anybody know? From 1776. I think it's over 200, isn't it? <clears throat> something, something like that. over 200 years. Then we celebrate 200 years a few, probably a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And so that's just 200 years, right? That the United States, the nation, this nation has been here the way that we know it. It's always been here, but the, that we know it as the United States, uh, a little over 200 years. Um, and the reason I said that is because when you think about that and you think about spending 430 years in poverty and enslavement to the Egyptian monarch, that's a long time. So they saw many uh, decades go by. Uh, they saw people born, saw people die, went through, a, you know, a, a lot of history right there in slavery. You know, some people, I just like to bring out some points because sometimes we read so fast, you know, 430 years they were in slavery. That's a long time. That's a very long time. So in that verse, Joseph tells his family to swear to carry his remains back to the promised land after he dies. This is an example of Joseph's faith in God's promise to Abraham. 
Isaac, and Jacob to bring them to the land of Canaan, uh, the land that we call um, the promised land. Get into all of that. Uh, Joseph's plan for his body's future are based on his confidence in God's promise and his request shows his faith. Amen. Any questions? Comments? As Exodus continues, the Lord commissions Moses to spearhead this deliverance and to lead the Israelites into uh, the promised land a central part of the covenant God had made with Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 to make his descendants into a great nation. Remember the fivefold uh, uh, blessing that God made to Abraham and deliverance and freedom was one of them. And uh, their people as many as the sand of the sea in other words, you can't count them. When Pharaoh gives no regard to Moses' petition to let the, uh, the Lord's people go free out of slavery, God inflicts the 10 plagues upon Egypt. Remember that? Everybody remembers that. So at the cost of losing his firstborn son, in the 10th and final plague, Pharaoh finally agrees to set the Israelites free, but then had a sudden change of heart, and he pursues them to the Red Sea. There's a list of the 10 plagues in the order that they uh, that, that brought up them upon the land of Egypt, the blood uh, the frogs, the gnats, the flies, uh, livestock uh, would die, boils, hail, locusts, darkness, firstborn, um, where all of the firstborn of the Egyptians would die. The firstborn of everything, the cattle, the people, everything would die. So those are the plagues. And even after all of those plagues, uh, Pharaoh didn't renege. Well, at the end, he says, okay, you can go. I'm tired of you. Go, you know. And then he, uh, he decides to pursue them after they started walking on their journey. He decides, no, I'm going to, you know, I'm still going to kill them. But we know what happened. Any questions on the plagues? Well, I think we talked about the plague a long time ago, and we were trying to figure out which one would be the, the worst one that you would have to go through. I, I don't like flies, <laughs> so that, that might that, that have got me right there, you know, but uh, all of them are terrible. Uh, uh, like, for instance, when you read uh, about the frogs, they were like everywhere in the food on, you know, you couldn't walk, uh, you couldn't lay down, uh, you know, they would just be all over you. So and this uh, would go on. Uh, darkness and not just nighttime darkness, total darkness, total darkness that we can't even imagine. You know, what about hell uh, pounding it for a long time um, on humans, animals, trees? Hell can do a lot of damage, can it? And so they uh, they suffered a lot of damage. But even after all of that, Pharaoh was still hard hearted and didn't want to let God's people go. OK, questions, comments? You say you like that uh, the little graph, Pastor Sam? <laughs> okay. All right, and look at uh, Pharaoh. He, he's, uh, after he let the people go, he's, uh, that's when he decides that he, he's going to go after them anyway. 
And so that's a little picture of what that might have looked like. But we know what ultimately happened, right? Would you read that, Pastor Sam? Exodus, Exodus 15, 4. Pharaoh's chariot and his army has cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depth have covered them. They sink to the bottom like a stone. So ultimately, we know what happened. Um, God parted the sea, and uh, the children of Israel walked over on dry land, not mud, not a little water, but totally dry land. That was a miracle. And uh, so Pharaoh and his army was right behind them. And uh, when the children of Israel got to the other side and they were just about in the middle, you know, still after them, the water came back in and covered Pharaoh and his army and they sank to the bottom of the sea like a stone. Okay. God has a way of taking care of our enemies. And if God has you on a plan, it's going to be carried out no matter what it looks like. And um, you're going to see where these people did not walk in a lot of faith at this time. But um, the whole point, one of the points, I believe, of, you know, God preserving the Exodus um, story is to encourage us in our faith. That like for them, if he uh, has promised to bring them into deliverance, into a land flowing with milk and honey, that means everything that you need then he's certainly going to make sure you get there, no matter what it looks like to our natural. He's going to make sure it happens. Just trust him. Amen. And there you go. There's a picture of them in the middle of the sea with the water covering over them. And they're getting ready to drown. picture of uh, Moses and his nephew Aaron who was with him. We're going to talk about a little bit about these pictures and what they represent. So here God delivers the Israelites from Pharaoh's clutches once more by parting the water and allowing the Israelites to cross safely. And then he closes up the gap and swallows Pharaoh and his army in the ensuing tor torment. Uh, it's in Exodus 14. And at last, the Israelites were free, a free people. So they continue on their journey. They finally got away from Pharaoh. Okay. And there they are. They began their, their journey across the Sinai, uh, the desert, very hot, uh, very few trees, and if you see one, it's probably not edible. So they're going to start doing a lot of murmuring and complaining. Okay, what are we going to eat? What are we going to, you know, didn't they just see the deliverance of God bringing them through a, a sea of water? You know, they and, and people forget real quick, don't they? God can bring them through uh, this, uh, um, you know, one situation after, and then, you know, you go to another situation, and what am I going to do? You know, the same way God worked it out the first, second, third time, he'll c continue to do it. He's, uh, he's not a man that he should lie, and uh, he's, he's not like us. He's not wishy-washy, you know. Um, one day you're up, you know, one day, you know, uh, you can depend on somebody's word. The next day you can't. So, but he was with them. Even through the murmuring and complaining. It wasn't because they were so good. It was because of what? 
What was it because? What was it because? Why was God so faithful to these people? Because he, because he promised um, Abraham, promise of Abraham. Exactly. Exactly. exactly so it was because of abraham um that they um were taken care of and god brought them to deliverance into the land flowing with milk and honey okay. but i would also like to add that the reason that they were enslaved in egypt is because of their sin. Now, he was their chosen people, but when they would sin, they would be punished for it. I said it was not because of their obedience. Yes. From here, they pressed onward to Mount Sinai, where God bestowed Moses with the Ten Commandments. So they, they're on this journey. They're going through the, the desert and um, so God wants to lay down the law and he wants to give Moses, the children of Israel, the 10 commandments, not the 10 suggestions, uh, commandments through Moses. Okay. I found this old couple of minute video from uh, the old Exodus movie. <laughs> Oops. From the burning bush, O Lord, you charged me to bring the people to this holy mountain to behold your glory and receive your law. What have I left undone?
found this thing the most. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> and there they are again, uh, the Ten Commandments that Moses received. Thou shall have no other gods before me. Thou shall not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shall not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. And thou shalt not covet. Okay. Ah. Uh, any questions? I have a comment, but uh, did somebody try to say something in the video? Well, it was just a little low. You couldn't hear the sound too good. That's all. I know. I it's uh, and I had it. My sound turn all. I got to turn it. Oh, back. okay. That's a matter of fact, um, it's an old classic, and I just thought it was neat to put that in. It. But uh, he was receiving the um, the Ten Commandments. He went up on the mountain, Mount Sinai, to receive the the message, the Ten Commandments straight from God. And uh, he left Aaron in charge. We've talked about this before. He left them in charge of the people, you know. Uh, and um, what happened? People, was, they were breaking one of the, a couple of the, the commandments before they even got it. They were uh, making a God for themselves. They couldn't wait for uh the God of heaven. They, you know, I guess they thought he was too slow and we wanted something tangible. Uh, people are like that, aren't they? They they want something that they can feel, touch, you know, with their hands uh, as far as worship. That's why people have, you know, different artifacts as far as religion, because they, they feel they got to have something in their hands to touch or feel. And, so they melted down all of their jewelry, their earrings, their gold, and they had Aaron. They talked Aaron into to uh, to making this golden calf for them to worship. Any questions or comments on that? Okay, let's go on. Yeah, I had a comment on that. If you notice, like a, a lot of the stuff that's going on now, um, even the Olympics, that was one of the things that was brought out was the calf mm -hmm. so it's almost like we're going back to uh, those days it's like coming to to pass like coming to pass but coming to like the future of what was told before us like it's Absolutely. happening again in our world the people are turning the same way aren't they um evil is rampant and it just seems like every day you see something else that makes you cringe uh, as far as the way the world is getting. It's getting worse on a daily basis. 
you know, it's almost unbelievable. Uh, Pastor Sam mentioned what went on at, you know, with the, the mobile abortion uh, ban at the uh, convention, the DNC convention in Chicago. They, they killed in uh, Monday and Tuesday, uh, death toll was 35 babies. 35 babies. That, that, that's unbelievable, isn't it? That is crazy. So yeah, they, said the, that, mm-hmm. they said that was the one that was in St. Louis is the one that's up in Chicago. Is that the one? Well, that's the, Illinois. that's the, yeah, they, they took the one that that's the one that's in Chicago right now okay. is the one that's in St. Louis. Cause the I, I did hear that on the news. Yeah. They take the that one in St. Louis. Louis. Yeah, exactly. Wow. That's amazing. Crazy. It is. And they take that one from St. Louis and drive the people over to Carbondale to get abortion for it. Yep. So See, they get out, this is get over like, into Illinois, and then they can legally do abortions. Yeah, it's not even an issue there. But um, it is, you know, everything is turning back the way that it seemed to have been back in those days when people were just wow. all into false gods, false idol, uh, idol worship. And that was, we'll see that what that was one of the things that God told them and commanded them when they go into Canaan. The people there are not like you. The people there don't have a God like you, mm-hmm. even though they weren't doing right themselves. Mm-hmm. But they worship idols. They worship false gods. Do not mix in with them come out from among them. You are to take the land, mm-hmm. not mix in with what they're doing. Mm-hmm. And so you can, as we go through this, yeah, you can see a lot of things that are happening right before our eyes that the children of Israel went through. Mm-hmm. The same thing. Okay. Okay, let's, okay. All right, Pastor Sam is going to share some things here uh, on the Ten Commandments. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody had just come, come in, you know, it's good. they're going back. It definitely is. Now, that statue that you happen to be looking at is an idol. And guess where it's located? It's in the state of Missouri on our state capitol building. And play the video, Pastor Elon. Now, uh, in Jump City, our state capital, they was doing a remodel job. They redid the whole thing. They had took the statue down. And a lot of a few Christians got together and told them not to put the statue back up there because of it was an idol, you know, in Greek mythology, the agricultural demon. But the, the politicians insisted on putting it back up. They even sent it to Chicago to have it redid, redrawn, recoded, replayed it. Spent four hundred thousand dollars in doing it, and then put it back up there. Idol worship. The goddess of agriculture. Okay, okay now the next short, okay, go ahead. Any, no, any, go ahead. I didn't know if you wanted to say any something. Comment, any comments on that one? That statue, we had talked about that one before. Now, that was, uh, that's one of the false gods that uh, uh, I think Jonathan Cunn talked about in his book, The Return of the Gods and that, you know. 
Okay, but played it. I'm going to explain that later on after we look at the Ten Commandments. She wanted me to do two uh, of the commandments, and I picked out the first two, one and uh, verse uh, one and two. No other gods, you know, and you should not worship other gods. And so uh, this video can explain it a lot better than I can. He's a, they, he did a good job in explaining it. Uh, go ahead, Pastor Ivan. Let's discuss the second commandment according to the oldest, that is the Jewish enumeration of the Ten Commandments. In Christian tradition, it's the first commandment. The most common translation begins, you shall have no other gods before me. The commandment then goes on to prohibit both making idols and worshiping idols. Most people, when they think of this commandment, understandably think that it only prohibits the worship of idols and the worship of gods, such as the ancient pagan gods of rain, of fertility, all the other nature gods, and chief gods, such as the Roman Jupiter and the Greek Zeus. However, there is a major problem with this understanding of the commandment. And today worships these gods, let alone worships idols made of stone, most people think that this commandment is irrelevant to modern life. The irony, however, is that this commandment is not only relevant to modern life, it is in many ways the mother of all the other commandments. Why is it so relevant today? Because today we have as many false gods as the ancients did. And why is it the mother of all the other commandments? Because if we identify false gods and avoid worshiping them, we will eliminate one of the greatest barriers to a good world, false gods. So let's begin by defining a false god. The point of biblical monotheism is that there is only one god, and that only this god, the creator of the universe, who demands that we keep these Ten Commandments, is to be worshipped. Why? First, because one God means one human race. Only if we all in creator or father, as it were, are we all brothers and sisters. Second, having the same parent also means that no person or group is intrinsically more valuable than any other. And third, one God means one moral standard for all people. If God declares murder wrong, it is wrong for everyone, and you can't go to another God for another moral standard. When anything else is worshipped, bad things result. Not only things that can obviously lead to evil, such as the worship of power, or race, or money, or flag, but also things that are almost always seen as quite beautiful, such as art, or education, or even love. Yes, any of these often wonderful things, when worshipped, can lead to terrible results. Take art. Many of the cruelest history loved beautiful music and art. But as a music lover, I learned early in life the sad fact that great music can be used to inspire people to follow evil just as much as it can be used to inspire people to do good. The great Hollywood director Stanley Kubrick vividly <laughs> made this point in his classic 1971 film, A Clockwork Orange. In it, men rape and murder while classical music plays in the background. Take education. We all recognize how important education can be from preparing people to be able to find work to understanding the world. But education in and of itself, divorced from the higher ends of God and goodness, can lead and often has led to great evil. Many of the best educated people in Germany supported Hitler and the Nazis, and almost all of the Western supporters of the genocidal regimes of Stalin in the Soviet Union and Mao in China were highly educated. There is nothing about a PhD that guarantees a person will be wiser, kinder, or more ethical than someone with only a high school education. The same holds true even of love. Love, of course, is so often beautiful, but it too can lead to evil. In the 20th century, people who put love of country above love of God and goodness often committed terrible evil. And here's a test for you. 
Imagine that the pet you love and a stranger, a person you don't know and therefore could not possibly love, are drowning. Do you first try to save your pet or the stranger? Well, if love is an end in itself, you save your pet. But if you hold life as a higher value than love, you won't follow love. This commandment made the ethical revolution of the Bible and of the Ten Commandments, what is known as ethical monotheism, possible. Worship the God of the Ten Commandments, and you will make a good world. Worship a false god, no matter how noble-sounding, and you will end up with a world of cruelty. I'm Dennis Prager. Join Prager University. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Okay, now if there's any questions about that video, he really did a great job in explaining that. Okay, if there's no questions, we'll go ahead. Let's read the, the notes. But the Israelites failed to obey God, almost immediately breaking commandments by indulging in idolatry. Because of their lack of loyalty to God, who had just liberated them from tyranny, he punished them for 40 years of wandering through the desert wilderness before being able to enter the promised land. Now, God being a just God, what America is doing now is worse than what they were doing, so America can look forward to, and I really believe, because we're going through some of it right now, a little bit of what's going on, what happened to the Israelis. During this time, the Israelite experienced the humbling dependence on God that come from learning to fully, fully reply upon him. It's a sad story, even though we know how great the eventual ending is, and it's normal to wonder why the Israelites couldn't just do what they were supposed to do. Why do you think God's people are so stubborn and disobedient? Well, that's not just God's people now. It's people here. Uh, uh, well, we are God's people. We here in America are stubborn and disobedient. But there are also some important lessons we can learn from the Israelites years spent wandering in the wilderness, in the desert there. Okay, now, uh, there's a lot of people that talk now to say the Ten Commandments was Old Testament, and it's not for us today. My wife had a discussion with a person on Facebook about that, and he was a very learned person, author and everything, and he didn't believe that the Ten Commandments was for today. But if you read the Bible in 1 John 2, 4 and 5, it's plain that the Ten Commandments is for us today. Because it says, he who says, I know him and does not keep his commandments is a liar and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him, and it's just that if we keep his commandments. If you're walking around and not keeping in his commandments, then you do not know God. That's plain. Amen. That's plain as a, a, a well, I won't go into detail, but it's pretty plain there. Any questions about uh, 1 John 2, 4 and 5? Or the videos. Other videos, yes. <laughs> okay. Let me let's back up to that question. Why do you think God's people are so disobedient? Mm -hmm. We we can understand people who don't know God. Mm -hmm. You know, because it, it should be natural. That's the natural thing for them to do: to be mm -hmm. stubborn, disobedient, liars, all, the whole gamut. They don't know God. Mm -hmm. But when you uh, see a, a person who professes to be a uh, Christian, a born-again believer, mm -hmm. uh, where they have put all of that old stuff aside mm -hmm. and they now walk in the newness of God, mm -hmm. uh, and you still see them being stubborn, disobedient, uh, 
liars, cruel, uh, you know, uh, and some more adjectives we could uh, add as well. Mm -hmm. So why do you think uh, it's so hard for, or maybe you don't think, maybe you don't see it the way I see it. Well, I was looking at it in the sense you know, that the Israeli yeah. people, I was going to answer your question. I was looking at it in the sense that the Israeli people did not have the Holy Spirit living in them the way that we Christians do now when we get saved and born again. Well, that's my question. Why do you think it's happening now? Well, I don't believe that the, if it's happening to people who say that they are Christians now, then they Stubborn have not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you have the Holy Spirit living in you, then you are going to keep God's Ten Commandments. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Why do you think uh, God's people are so stubborn or disobedient? Or maybe you know, are you saying, or maybe you're saying, I don't think so. I don't agree with that. <laughs> In other words, it's uh, there's no um, division, or there's no difference. In, the, in a lot of cases, in the majority of cases, between mm -hmm. people who don't know the Lord and people who know the Lord in their attitudes, their stubbornness, disobedience, uh, not doing the right thing and so forth. Mm -hmm. So that was that was the point there. Mm -hmm. All right, let's go on. Okay. Uh, got a couple of little maps here to kind of show you the route. Uh, that the uh, children of Israel uh, took to go to the um, uh, to Canaan, and that red, those red or yellow dots, whatever they are, that's the uh, the route. Um, you can see where all of the different uh, places are put. Uh, you see Egypt right there, the Nile River, uh, ocean. Okay, all of the, and that's the route. It went all the way down to the Sinai Desert. Okay, and then it went up here. Look at this. What do you think happened here? Huh? What do you think happened in the uh, wilderness of Zen? We'll talk about it. <laughs> um, but then after this little episode here and then they continue their route through Edom, the Edomites, the Moabites, all of the ites, um, and all the way up to Jordan, and Jericho, to, in other words, all the way to Israel. Okay. Got another one here, I think. Yeah. This is uh, another graph that I found. Um, so it's saying it, it took three months to go from Egypt to Sinai. Mm -hmm. can see it with this thing here. Um, and there's a little graph. And then in, um, from Sinai, they spent 13 months in this area where Moses, uh, mm -hmm. received the, um, the 10 commandments mm -hmm. and then look at, <laughs> look how they zigzag and, from Sinai to Canaan was 38 years, 38 years. Is that uh, when all the, the people that came out of Egypt uh, died and there was a new generation? Cause all the old, mm -hmm. uh, the older people died cause mm -hmm. they couldn't go into the promised land. Yeah, and, and the oh, new, the new right, right, the new generation came, crossed right. over. That's why it took thirty eight years. And that was uh, it, it. Didn't have to be that way. <laughs> yeah. Again, we have to talk about their stu stubbornness, their disobedience, mm -hmm. uh, not listening, and which caused them to wind up being in that desert in that area for 38 years, wandering round and round and round and round mm -hmm. uh, before going into the promised land. We know Moses didn't go either, right? Aaron did go. 
none of the old generations went into the promised land. Because of disobedience, yes. So who took them? Who took them into the promised land? Let's see if anybody knows that. Who who wound up in leading them into the promised land? Joshua. Joshua. And yes. Caleb. Yes. On oh, Caleb. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think I got another little graph here. Okay. Oh, this is a bigger map. It just kind of shows you the same thing, a little bit more colorful. <laughs> There's Egypt on the left side and tells you some of the things that happened there. And then the pink line is the route again. There's a little dotted thing there. Well, this represents, as you can see, judgment. Mm -hmm. 38 years of wandering. Mm -hmm. So this was God's judgment on them for disobedience, uh, that they wandered round and round. And can you imagine that? Just looking at that now and imagining, uh, you know, I think we've done enough, enough studying of the area to know about the size of that. Yes. You know, and they couldn't have the vision to move away from that mm -hmm. small area. In other words, they just lived in that small area right in there mm -hmm. before moving out and going into the promised land, mm -hmm. going into Canaan up, up here at the top Jericho. Mm -hmm. So all of that came from disobedience. And in the middle, you can see some of the things that happened um, in this stretch. Um, God, you know, that's where God gave them water from a rock. He told uh, Moses to, to hit the rock. Mm -hmm. And that's how they got water. Uh, um, the Ten Commandments were given, the golden calf, some of the things that happened uh, down there. The uh, tabernacle at the bottom middle there. Remember, they made the movable tabernacle where they would as assemble and uh, re-erect when they got to the next side. In other words, they would uh, move some, some um, miles and then they would re-erect the tabernacle. Uh, they And then when the Lord lifted the cloud, the glory cloud, they would uh, continue marching on mm -hmm. and um, they would disassemble. So it was, uh, you know, a, right. um, a movable mm -hmm. uh, place where the, the priest would go in to make atonement for the people. Yeah, I like this. Okay. Uh, Any questions, after, comments? Yeah. I had a comment. Uh, during this time period, we didn't talk about God literally killed thousands of the Israelis, the original people, for their disobedience, you know, and for their complaining and sin. Mm -hmm. A lot of them died because God would open the earth and swallow them up and kill them and call plagues to come on among the died. For well, snakes, none of them. When you talk about the snake, you die, serpents go in and bite them and kill a lot of them, and that, you know. No, none of them went. None of them went into the uh, promised land. Right. Mm -hmm. None of the original. Mm -hmm. Because of sin. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at uh, the Israelites ambushed by Amalekites in the desert. Now that was one of the things that uh, that happened that we mentioned earlier. Um, I will just start reading. I have to keep moving this thing that's in my way of reading. Uh, Exodus 17, beginning with verse 8, and I think we go to uh, 13. Okay. Now, Amalekite came and fought with Israel in Repidian. And Moses said to Joshua, Choose us some men and go out and fight with, Am fight with Amalek. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur 
went up on the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand, the Israeli prevailed. And when he let his hand down, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hand became heavy, so they took a stone and put under him and set him on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and one on the other side. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Amen. And uh, that's a picture here of what it, that battle mm -hmm. might have looked like. So according to the Bible, the Amalekites attacked the uh, Israelites at Rahavdin after the Israelites escaped Egypt and camped there. Uh, this is known as the Battle of Rephidim. Moses told Joshua to select men to fight the Amalekites while he, Aaron, and her went up uh, went up a hill to pray. Moses's prayers were said to be a key factor in the outcome of this battle. Amen. As the battle progressed, the Amalekites began to gain the advantage and Moses became tired. Aaron and her helped Moses by holding his arms up and bringing him a rock to sit on. As long as Moses kept his hands raised, the, Amalek, uh, I'm sorry, the Israelites prevailed. But when he lowered it, the Amalekites would win. Eventually, Joshua and the Israelites defeated the Amalekites with God's help, of course. The Battle of Rephidim was the first of several conflicts between the Israelites and the Amalekites over the next few hundred years. The next few hundred years. Remember, I always tell you guys, um, uh, all of them kites and Amalekites and Moabites and all of those people, they were all enemies of God and enemies of God's people. And they were, and the Israelites were always in some kind of battle, one battle after another. When you read the Old Testament, you know, they're, they're coming out of one battle and then they're going into another battle. And it was always with these people. So uh, this was one of those uh, battles when they were ambushed. So sin will always take you further than you want to go. In Exodus 32, 9, I have seen these people, the Lord said to Moses, and they are a what a stiff-necked people. What does that look like? What does a stiff neck person look like? You ever thought about that? What do you think God meant? Have you ever called somebody a stiff neck person? Anybody? Nobody? You don't know what that means? Well, there's my answer right there. They were always, always complaining. <laughs> lack of faith, their hearts were far from God, things far too common for the Israelites during the wandering years. In other words, they were prideful, they were arrogant, uh, they were uh, complaining, lack of faith, all of these things, and they just really got on God's nerve a lot of times. If it hadn't been for Abraham and the promise, I'm sure I'm sure God would have just said, I'm done with them. I'm done with them. 
but God is faithful, right? So he's dealing with these stiff-necked people. And that just means that they were so arrogant. He would tell Moses, and, and poor Moses, poor Aaron, poor Joshua. You know, he would tell them to, to do, to lead the people here and, you know, to maybe camp out, uh, to do this. Um, uh, they didn't want uh, the food that, remember, they're in the desert. So remember how they ate. God would feed them manna from heaven. They ate heavenly food, would float down from the heavens. You know, so God would supernaturally feed them in the desert. And so what did they say? I think I got that somewhere in here. <laughs> Don't we have something else? <laughs> you know, just like us. You know, if we have to eat leftovers the next day, don't we have something else? I was getting ready to say, I guess I was a stiff-necked person from till I was about 45 years old. <laughs> <laughs> till I got saved, yes. But they were complaining, lack of faith, hearts far mm -hmm. from God, too, too far thing, I'm sorry, things far too common in the Israelites during uh, the uh, wandering years. It's often easy to lose sight of how far sin is carrying you away from the direction God is trying to take you, even after being redeemed through his mercy and grace. You would think that they would just be so overjoyed and just thanking God and praising him and getting them out of slavery, taking care of the enemy and taking them through uh, desert places and feeding them from uh, food from heaven, heavenly food. Nope. Nope. They still complain. They complain about Aaron. They complain about Moses and you know, it started really when they went up on, when Moses went up on the mountain to get the Ten Commandments. They couldn't wait. They couldn't wait for him to get back. You know, they started murmuring, we need a God. We need something to worship. And that's when they made that golden calf. So it's, you know. Thank God for who he is, because I think a lot of us do a lot of murmuring and complaining when we shouldn't, you know, so let's go on. Any questions or comments? You guys are quiet tonight. Okay. So what may start as a dissatisfied, grumbling heart can lead you further into a place you never wanted to be. Still, God in his forgiveness this lifts us out and places us on solid ground. Even with all of the Israelites' shortcoming, the Lord outstretched his arms and said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Wow. I can say one thing. Well, I, 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 I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. It's, that's, that's one of my, my shortcomings. Murmuring and complaining people. You know, it, it's, it's like, it just, you know, Sometimes we just have to adjust to new things or unpleasant things, um, things we don't like. You know, uh, if somebody suggests one thing, you want to do something, well, I'm not going to, I don't want to go. I don't want to do it. Sometimes we need to walk around with a recorder and listen to ourselves in the evening after a, a day around people. And, and see what, and listen to what we sound like. 
probably get an idea of what God was dealing with with these people. You know, just different things. And, and whether it was 30 people or a few million people, 30,000 rather, you know, that's a 30,000 is a lot of people when they're all complaining and getting on your nerve, right? But in Exodus thirty three fourteen, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. That's faithfulness. That's real faithfulness. That's agape love, right? Mm -hmm. You all know what agape love is. Agape love is unconditional love. He's doing this because of unconditional love. And, and God teaches us that all through the Bible, Jesus teaches us that when he's born and when he begins to lead the people and, and his disciples in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. I mean, the ultimate was him going to the cross, right? Mm -hmm. In the presence, right there on the cross, people saying, you know, why don't you just get off the cross? Why don't you just, you know? And then his friends started walking away mm -hmm. and he still did it. That's unconditional. That statement there, Exodus 33, that's unconditional love. That's agape love. Agape love seeks nothing in return. You just do it. I got a need. I need some help. Just do it. If you can, just do it. That's, that's agape love. We I all need to pra practice that a little bit more. Yes, sir. I had a comment on this, and my presence will always be with you. Moses was great. See, his God's presence was with Moses, but after uh, in the book of Acts one eight, uh, and then after the book of Acts and two thirty, when the Holy Spirit fell, the God's presence lived within believers now, within us. Amen. It's a big difference Amen. there, and that's what's really distinguished. But made Moses' job a little harder. God's presence was with Moses, but now, like Peter and Paul and John, the Holy Spirit was within them. Okay, the, what I about changed, I changed what? Peter after the Holy Spirit came into Peter's presence? You know. Is the Holy Spirit making a difference in people today? Well, if you feel with the Holy Spirit, yes, and allow Him to, you have a free will. If you feel with the Holy Spirit and walk with the Lord, it's making a big difference. Okay. You can't go against the word of God. Yes. Okay. There's uh, people going across the desert. That's what, um, you know, I just found that picture. I'm not sure if that's the Israelites. <laughs> but mm -hmm. That's what they, to me, that's what it, uh, it would probably, when we were in Israel, we got to see a, a desert from afar and uh, from a hill, we could see the desert and uh, or the beginning of it. And it's, and we've seen videos of uh, some people from there making videos to show us, you know, what, uh, what these areas, these desert areas look like, uh, just barren heat uh, hot in the daytime and cold at night uh, very little green anything sand in your eyes in your shoes and everything so in miles and miles and miles of this no okay all right seven I want to talk Seven rebellions. I might. Okay, we'll start this. Um, once the people leave Mount Sinai in, in the book of Numbers, for, uh, chapter 10, things go terribly wrong. Now, remember where Sinai was? That's in that middle place on that map. Mm -hmm. That's kind of in the middle. Yes. Um, Every story to follow begins with a moment 
of Israelite insurrection. The people complain or they rebel or they grumble. Um, in Numbers 11, 4, or 11, 1 and 4, you want to read that, Pastor Sam? Okay. Now, now, when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. So the children of Israel also wept again and said, who will give us meat to eat? There they go. <laughs> <laughs> there they go. And that went on and on and on several verses, you know, where they are complaining and blaming Moses. And why did you bring us here? We might as well just stayed in, you know, in slavery in Egypt. They said that. We should have just left us in left us in Egypt. Okay. Here's some complaining. Okay. And Aaron, you want to read that? Go ahead. Yes, I'll read it for you. And and Marion and Aaron spoke against Moses, and all the community raised their voice and grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And Korah with Nathan and Abaran with 250 leaders of the community rose up against Moses. And the entire community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the people quarreled with Moses and the people spoke against God and Moses. Okay, so here are the seven, the rebellions. Uh -huh. um, well, six. There was, I'm missing one. But anyway, all of these are uh, verses where they begin to grumble and complain and uh, speak against Moses and rise up. And, you know, like I said, and Moses was like stuck out there with them. What could he do? Um, he was following what God, you know, wanted him to do, but it had to be very, it, it's hard leading people. It's hard. <laughs> it's hard leading people. My, I, I guess my easiest uh, job, me and Pastor Sam, is uh, being leader or pastor of uh, our church for uh, a lot of years. But I was also a, a manager at the uh, uh, Southwestern Bell AT and T, and I, you know, there were some people that were under my leadership that you know if it was left up to me <laughs> I would have uh, walked away from them or you know asked them to be changed to another department or whatever people are sometimes hard to to lead you know we're all here and you know as far as like a, a job or something like that we're all here trying to money to so we can eat and so we can live you know let's try to get along but you always have people who want to go against the grain you know uh and it, it almost seems like some people try their hardest not to be in compliance not to be cooperative you know just because it's like almost like in their nature you know, you ask them to do something, they roll their eyes or roll their necks and all of that kind of stuff. That's that's crazy. So I'm sure Moses and Aaron and the rest of them had some, a few neck rollers, eye rollers, and everything else. Any uh, questions, comments? And I think we'll stop after this next slide. So that's a lot of anger, grumpy people. Each story highlights a different type of rebellion that starts for different kinds of reasons. Okay. And uh, in Numbers uh, 11 through 21, chapters 11, 21, it's worth whipping out a colored pencil or a highlighter and taking note of all of the repeated words that connect, you know, uh, 
basically the rebellions, the, uh, the complaining, and just see how many you can find. And that's where that story, part of the story is. So um, we're going to go ahead and stop right there. Uh, I think that's a good place to stop, and we'll pick it up on Friday. So let me do this. Any questions or comments? Let me stop my recorder too, please. Mm -hmm.